open your Bibles to the book of Colossians, and then also to the book of Acts. You'll find the book of Acts before you get to Colossians, but we're going to start with Colossians first. What an incredible weekend to remember the suffering, the sacrifice of Jesus. We had a good Friday and today we have a great Sunday because of the gospel, because of what is done. There's one particular verse that stands out for me in the book of Colossians that I want to trust the Holy Spirit to illuminate for us. It's the faith that you and I need in the power of God. You see, if we, if we don't understand the faith that is needed in your life, in God's power, in God's energy, in God's ability, in God's working, then this Passion Weekend will only be about what happened to Jesus. And I mean, I'm so grateful for what happened to Jesus, but, but at some point it has to translate to what happened to you because of what happened to Jesus. That's what we, that's what we celebrate. There's lots of biblical evidence, there's lots of stories, there's lots of testimonies, especially in the Gospels, about the fact that Jesus was raised to life. It was 500 that saw him. They didn't see a ghost. They saw the resurrected Jesus. They witnessed the power of God to raise a dead man to life. But we can't just be historical in that resurrection power. It has to be a present reality for us this morning. Otherwise, we'll just go home and say, wow, it was quite an intellectual morning. It's amazing. I didn't know that happened to Jesus as well. But nothing else actually happened to you. And so in the book of Colossians, Paul is dealing with two issues. People that are legalistic and people that become mystics. Now the, the challenge with them is the, the legalists, they're trying to obey rules to try and deal with essential indulgences that they have. They want to bless their flesh. And they think if they put rules in place, then they're going to be able to beat the sensual desires of their body. The other group, they think if they start to proclaim and pretend to be spiritual, they encounter angels and they see angels, then maybe then they'll be able to do something with the desires of their flesh for another beer. Or to look at a woman lustfully. Maybe if I can proclaim, tell people, I see angels when I have quiet times. Then maybe I will arrive. Paul says, listen, you have to understand what happened to Jesus in his death and his resurrection. And so in the book of Colossians, Paul is wanting to get the church to stand up to live in the resurrection power that's ours already. And so there's three ways he's building an argument. There's three ways he's building the argument. Firstly, he says, if you know the fullness or the supremacy of Jesus Christ, it'll transform your whole world. Let's pick up what he's saying in, in, in Colossians 1.15. He's talking about if you knew the fullness and the supremacy of who Jesus is, then you will see that your life will be transformed. He says in verse 15, he says, He is the image, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. 
He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Whether things on earth or things in heaven. By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. If you understand the supremacy of who Christ is and how awesome he is. Verse 21 says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not, uh, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in this gospel. The first argument, Paul says, you want to beat your flesh? Understand the bigness of who Jesus is. You're not going to get into legalism or you're not going to get into trying to be super spiritual. If you get who Jesus is, it'll transform you. Second argument, he says, you have to understand that you were united with him in death. If you understand the bigness of who Jesus is, and if you can comprehend that the two of you were made one at the cross, he says your life cannot be the same. It's like plugging your finger into a 220 volt plug. I tell you what, you will not stand like this. When you realize who you've been united to, this big Jesus, who's the first in everything, who has the power to create everything, when you realize that you got plugged into him at the cross, I tell you what, your worship will start to look different. It's not like, praise Jesus. It's awesome. Oh, he did that. Oh, the suffering. You realize, oh my goodness, everything has been changed. My spirit God united with His. We won. Where did it happen? In death at the cross. Listen to how he puts this in Colossians 2, verse 6. He's talking of his second argument. The bigness of who Jesus is. The fact that you have to comprehend you united with Him. Your spirit was made one. He says in verse 6, So then, just as you received Christ as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. There's a preach in those two verses for a series. I'm going to try and preach the whole book of Colossians in one preach this morning. Verse 8 says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition on the basic and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who's the head over every power and authority. What's the point? Christ is big. And you are slotted into him. You have fullness. Verse 11 says, In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith, in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. Please underline that in your Bible. Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism. If you wonder why you should get water baptized, there's your answer. It symbolizes that you died with him. It says, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him, raised with him through your faith. If you have a Bible and a pen underlined through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. It says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. 
He forgave us all our sins. Praise the Lord. Having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Do you know the enemy is so embarrassed about what happened over this weekend? He's trying to keep it a secret. He's trying to go, shh. Because every time you declare the death and the resurrection of Jesus, hell gets embarrassed. They get reminded of their failure to try and keep a big Jesus small. It says, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon, celebra- a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Here the, hear the legalists. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Verse 7, it says, These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He's lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grow as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ, please don't align in your Bible, since you died with Christ. It wasn't just Jesus dying, it's you dying. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of the world, why as though you still belong to it do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. What's the point Paul is making? He says you have to get to the place where your flesh gets quieted. You have to become a mature believer. You can't stay a fleshly believer, always blessing your flesh, always giving into your sensual indulgences, what your body wants, giving to it. You have to understand this gospel of what happened to Jesus, and then you have to apply it by faith into your life to become mature. The fullness is out there. It's for you already. You have to grow into it by faith. Chapter 3, Paul helps us with how we do this. He says, since then you've been raised with Christ. Turn to your spouse and say, I have been raised with Christ. Say it like you mean it. There we go. There we go. It's not just about what happened to Jesus. It's what happened to you. How? By faith. By faith. Since then you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ. Wow. In God. You know why you can approach God with such freedom and confidence? Because your life is hidden in Christ. When you approach God, who does God see? He sees Christ. Because you are united. You are one. He found you in death. And by faith in this resurrection power of God, you are now living with Him. You're living in Him. You're hidden in Him. you got access to heaven. It can never be denied. Why? Because you're so good? Because you keep the rules so nicely? No. Because you're hidden in Christ. Because you can see angels and you're the super spiritual one that everyone tells us every time you go to the toilet, Jesus tells you everything about everyone else's life. No. Because your life is hidden in Christ. I mean, I'm amazed at people sometimes when they get the microphone. They want to tell us where they were at and what they were doing. And then the Lord spoke to them. It's like, hey, we know. You're not super spiritual. 
We know your life is hidden in Christ. That's why you get the information. That's for free. It wasn't part of the notes. Verse 4, when Christ who is your life appears, then he will also appear with him in glory. Wow, that's rich. One day when Jesus comes in his resurrected body to this earth, you know what's going to happen to this body? It's going to happen and look just like his. But for now, everything that's happened to me has happened within my spirit. It's happened within your spirit. It's time for you to get the reality of Christ in you to flow from you. How? By faith. Listen, it gets better. Verse 5. Jesus died. Jesus was raised to life. Now by faith, what must you do? He says, put to death. You must do it. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you might have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So what's the argument? The argument is Christ is massive. He is supreme. If you get that, your life will start to change. He's in control of everything. Everything was created by Him. Everything is for Him. It will all work out for your good and His glory. No matter what you're facing. Second argument Paul is making is saying, listen, not only is Jesus great, here's the big thing about the death. In the moment of death, you got united with greatness. You got united with the supreme Christ. Where and how, you will not believe it. He came to find you. This greatness humbled himself. He lived under a curse. He made himself available in death because that's where you were living. You were dead to God. But because you believe in his death, you got united. And here's the big one for this morning. Now, because you are united, you'll be raised to life. How? By your faith. Through your faith in God's power. What does it look like when the power of God comes down on your life? Let's turn to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> I 
Acts chapter 2 verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because, of, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears him in his own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, were, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some I ever made fun of them and said they had too much wine. What does it look like when the power of God that you have to put your faith in comes to your life? You know what happens? You become a witness to the nations. This morning you can measure how much faith do you have in this power of God that raised you. Because when the power comes down, you will tell others about it. Listen to what happens in Acts 2. Verse 29, Peter is trying to explain the power that came down. He says, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried in his tomb. And his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him and on an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ. That he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to their heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This morning, Jesus, as we come to your word, I thank you that we have the opportunity to celebrate and remind ourselves with clarity over this weekend of your death, the place where you found us, but also of your resurrection. Because of your resurrection, there's, there's the reality of spiritual things, the power of your Holy Spirit that is available to us. And I ask this morning for the hearers of your word, Lord, that, that they will hear clearly, that hearts would burn inside of them. I ask for myself, Lord, that you will anoint me fresh to serve your people well. I bless you and I honor you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You can open your Bible again back to Colossians. As most of what we were talking about comes from it. I want to talk to you this morning about faith for resurrection life. I want to talk to you about faith to live in Christ. It's the greatest shame that we would over this time just remember what Jesus did. Oh wow, Jesus, he did amazing things, but our lives never change. So the argument Paul has put together for us in the book of Colossians is the supremacy of Christ. He's supreme in every way. You've been united with Him. But here's the thing I want to talk to you about this morning. How? By faith. I want to talk to you this morning about how 
How do you live in Christ? How do you live this resurrection life? You need faith. Well, how do you get faith? Very simple. You hear the message about Christ. And so I'm going to very plainly talk to you about faith, two components of faith. How do you find your faith? And how do you feed your faith? If you can know how to find your faith, your life will never be the same again. Paul says this in Colossians 2. He says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus. How did you receive Christ Jesus? Through faith. But what did you hear about him? Where were you at when he found you? What was he doing when he found you? If you can hear how you receive Jesus, you will find your faith. If you can hear what he did on your behalf, you'll find faith. If you can know where you were at, you'll find faith. So how did you receive Jesus? Well, firstly, let's talk about where you were at when he found you. I know most of us this morning look like we've got it all together. Smell nice, look nice, dress nice. But the reality is your life was not together when Jesus found you. You were living under a curse, you were living under sin, and you were dead to God within your spirit. Jesus found you there. How did he find you? He was so faithful to leave heaven to come and make himself available to you under the cross, at the cross, so that you can get united with him. So you must pay attention. This is not a good Sunday school story. This will change your life forever. Where were you? Where are you this morning? You are dead in sin and transgression, a hater of God, wanting nothing to do with God. Jesus found you there. What was Jesus doing when he found you? What was he doing? He was suffering because of sin. It wasn't his sin. It was yours. It was mine. He was suffering because of your disobedience. Where was Jesus? What was he busy doing? He was being sacrificed because of his obedience. He was busy dying. That's how you receive Jesus. That's where you were at and that is what he was doing. He was obeying God the Father saying, Father, you love them so much, I cannot comprehend how much, but I will just obey you. Feels like it's too much to ask, but if that's what you want, I'll... I'll die. I'll give myself. And in death, he fully gets you. He becomes fully available to you because now God has reached out to find you in the place where you couldn't help yourself. If you're going to find your faith, you're going to have to remember how you receive Jesus. Paul says something happened to you in that moment. Your heart was cut. There was a circumcision in that moment of realizing Jesus died for you. Something happened to your heart. Your heart got cut by the Spirit. It's like, I need Jesus. I need Him. I need the salvation. I need this life. I need this hope. I cannot keep living in the curse. I cannot keep living in death. I have to accept Him. My friends, if your heart has never been cut by the Holy Spirit in that way, you are not born again. You do not have Jesus. You've not been united with Him. You might have done the rules that church has put on you or religion has put on you, but you're not alive. You're not one with Him. It's a big difference. So how did you receive Christ? You received Him when you weren't looking for Him. He came looking for you. He made himself available to be one with you. And then he says, I will make this thing effectual. I'll cut your heart with my spirit. Paul says, for a Jew to get circumcised, it was something. When they knip that foreskin, you would know. That's the point. 
When you get circumcised, you will know. You're not going to wonder. It's like, I wonder if I got circumcised. It was like, <laughs> wife, no physical labor for a month. I can't change the light bulbs, girl. How did you receive Christ? The circumcision of the Spirit. How would you know? You will know. If you don't know, you've not found your faith yet. You're believing a lot of things. And you've got lots of opinions on everything. And a little bit of Buddha. A little bit of the world. A little bit of this. But you've not found your faith yet. Because it's undeniable when the Spirit cuts you. Once you find your faith, you start to realize, man, this thing is real. This thing is real. This is not just a Sunday thing. It's an all-day thing. It's not just a moment. It's a life now. Paul says, once you've received him, remember how you received him. Now live in him. How do you live in him? By faith. You wait for the circumcision moments of the heart again. You see, once he's cut you, he keeps cutting your heart. He keeps cutting your heart. Doesn't matter how you try and behave, how you try and do things. When he cuts your heart, you know, I cannot keep sleeping around. I cannot keep drinking myself into a standstill thinking life will be different. I cannot keep watching porn. I cannot keep doing all those things. Why? Because of the cutting of the heart. You're learning to yield to the Spirit by faith. He says then, you learn to love by faith. You learn how to set your heart by faith. You might not feel like loving people. As a matter of fact, the old Yanis would say, stand a little bit closer so that I don't miss on the first shot. I don't want to go looking. Come closer. But by faith, you start to say, oh, bless you, my brother. Do you know how much faith this takes? Oh, Lord, bless them. Flesh says, no, man, you can do something more. Shh, shh, shh. Flesh, quiet. Lord, you bless them. Because it's the blessing of the Lord that will lead them to repentance. So I learned to love by faith. says you have to be built up in Christ. What is it talking about? It talks about you getting to the place where you think like Christ thinks. Your mind is set exactly the way Christ's mind is set. Your heart gets set. You know how to love by faith. But now the most challenging thing is between your ears. To get your mind set by faith. Thinking like he thinks, knowing what he knows. Having your image restored to think the way Christ thinks. How do you do that? By faith. And then we need to learn to enjoy Christ. It talks about you exploring by faith. Do you know that the supremacy of Christ, he's the firstborn over all creation. Have you got any idea what you can explore in Him? He made everything. He created it all. He's the only one that passed through death. Can you imagine exploring that by faith? So if we're going to have this resurrection life, friends, we have to find our faith. We have to hear about Christ. 
We have to hear what's available in him. We have to hear that there's more in him. We have to realize it needs a setting of my heart, a setting of my mind, and a journey to say, I just want to progress. I want to go into fullness, Lord, because it's mine already. Are we okay? This side of the church is dead quiet. It's good news. Then Paul goes into, how do, you, how do you feed your faith? It's an important thing to know, isn't it? If faith is the essence of how you, you live with Christ, how do you find it? So important to know. Secondly, how do you keep feeding it? Colossians 3, verse 1, he helps us. He says, since then you've been raised with Christ. Have you been raised with Christ? How can you be so sure? Have you got any evidence for me? Come now, show me that you've been raised with Christ. Hey? Bless you. I I used to hate you, now I bless you. That evidence sometimes is lacking, isn't it? What's the evidence? The substance of your heart. I just know like I know like I know I've been raised with Him. How? Because of the power of God. It says, since then, you've been raised with Christ. Now that your faith is working, now that you know the power of God raised Jesus and that you were united with Him, therefore you were raised to life, since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. What is he telling you? He's telling you how to feed your faith. He's telling you that you have to learn how to set your heart. You have to. Not God. There's certain things even Jesus cannot do for you. But Yanis, you just told me he's supreme over everything. Yeah, it's true. But he gave you a free will. And there's nothing that glorifies his name more when you out of your free will say, I love you so much, Jesus. I will set my heart after you. You see, we get disillusioned with God. Where's God? Where's God? Where's God? Why was He not there? He's there all along, but He's waiting for you to say, I will set my heart. I will align my heart with what? With what is already in heaven. So how do you set your mind? Thank you for asking. Paul is a master writer. And he gives us the answers. How, does we, how do we set our heart? Verse 15, Colossians 3, verse 15. He says this. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thank, thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish as one. How do you set your heart on heaven? How do you feed your faith? You have to learn to set your heart at peace. The moment you do that, you've set your heart on heaven. Do you know how much peace is in heaven? So peaceful there. You get to glimpse every now and then by faith. But the moment you can set your heart at peace, you're feeding your faith. The moment you can let the word of Christ dwell in your heart richly. What's the word about Christ? What's the logos about Christ? What is God saying about Christ? Hey. Can I help you? Colossians 1. Verse 22. Let this word dwell in your heart richly but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death 
to present you holy in His sight, without blemish, free from accusation. My friends. How do you set your heart in peace? You remember what God the Father says about Christ. You remember what God the Father says about the physical body of Jesus. It's through His body I am made holy. Woo. I'm so holy. Might not look good yet. Woo. But I'm holy. I am blameless. Free from accusation. I've got access to God. Oh, the peace. Oh, Jesus. Oh, thank you that I have peace. How do you do that by faith? You have to recognize when there's condemnation in your heart. You have to recognize when you're not feeling peace. You have to recognize something is off on the inside. I feel anxious. I feel condemned. Oh, I need to set my heart by faith. I might not feel it. It might not look lucrative, but I know I have to set my heart by faith. Lord, I've heard what you said about Christ. I'm in him now. Thank you that I can set my heart in peace. My friends, must I rather just tell you what Jesus did? Or am I helping you this morning by realizing what you must do? There's no power in remembering what Jesus did alone. The power comes when you learn to set your heart, feed your faith. How do you set your heart? Thank you, Paul, for helping us. Verse 16, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. How do you learn to set your heart by faith? You live with gratitude. Yeah, but Yanis, you don't know my mother-in-law. I know. I might not know the detail of what she can do. I know that you believe she's the witch of Endor. Can you set your heart in gratitude? You might not want it. You might not feel it. You might not even think that it's possible. But by faith, you can say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you that you died for me. That I died with you. And because I'm one with you, I'm alive with you. And now I can rule with you. I can reign with you over my evil mother-in-law. How often does the sons and daughters of God get entitled, but they don't live with gratitude? Oh, God must do this now, God must do that now, God must do this now, and then the church must do this, and then they must do that, and if not, then just, I'm going to find another one. Well, bless you, pilgrim. You're going to be walking for a long time, because the issue is inside here. You've not learned to set your heart on gratitude. What have you got to be grateful for? Oh my goodness. If you've missed that, you've missed this whole weekend. Jesus found you when you weren't looking for him. He made himself available to be united with you. My friends. And because you united with Him, and because He raised and defeated death, now you live with Him. I tell you what, if that doesn't get the disco going inside of you, I don't know what will. Samalak. You will not move me, son. I'm not trying to. I'm trying to tell you that it's time for you to wake up from your slumber because you should be grateful Amen. if you understand what Jesus did for you. He yes. says if we're going to feed our faith, we have to set our hearts, but also we have to learn to set our minds. This is the most difficult thing. Let's be honest. This thing gets in the way. So how do we set this thing?
It says in verse 9, Do not lie to each other. <laughs> Since you've taken off your old self with its practices, and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. How do you renew your mind? You have to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, only in you can I know anything about God. You have to get knowledge from God from who? From Jesus. What we know about God, we do not know because we observe God. What we know about God comes to us because we get revelation of who God is. The knowledge we live with, friends, is not observational knowledge. It's revelational knowledge. As I come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I've got father issues. My father used to abuse me. He used to be absent. He used to always just belittle me. Can it be that God is different? Can I know God as a father? Me personally. Can you please help me? What do you think the Holy Spirit will do? He says, let me teach you the true knowledge of who God is, that you can think right about Him. Is there anything else Jesus must still do for you? Nope. It's finished. It's done. What's left? Your faith. Your faith saying, Jesus, I need knowledge. I need to get what God thinks. I need understanding. Proverbs 4 says, lose everything as long as you gain understanding. Wow. You see, you can come to Jesus, and in Christ, He reveals knowledge about who God is. You can get to know Him. You can get to... Look at the scriptures and get to know him. I want to encourage you. This document can be intimidating. Is it right? It can also be an amazing sleeping pill. Have you discovered that? It can put you to sleep quite quick. Try to read it. Pick up a Wilbur Smith novel. My brother, you got to go the whole, whole holiday. But do five minutes in the Bible. It's like, ooh. Because I want to encourage you. Who's this book about? It's about God. You want to know Him? Start in Genesis chapter 1 and finish Revelation chapter 22 and ask, Who is God? Just read through that lens. Just discover God from the pages. Say, I don't know Him. I I don't have a reference for Him. I'm just going to read this book to see who's God. I want to know Him. Are you okay? I tell you, you can't be more energized ever. Get a pen, it's okay to write in your Bible. Get a couple of coloring cookies, it's okay to color in your Bible. You want to know God? Come to Jesus say, please help me. Who is He? I tell you what, you can do this with a standard one. You don't need a higher education in theology. Because you have the Spirit and you have the Word. All you need is faith. It's better. It says, how do you feed your faith? It says, you have to get to Christ and allow Him to restore the image of your Creator. Woo! Wow, now this thing is going ding, 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 like hitting the jackpot, can't be. Do you know in whose image you were made, according to Genesis 1.26? Help me. Maybe this side of the church is getting there. Who, this side of the church. In whose image were you made? What was God doing in Genesis 1.26? Yep, he was making man, but what was God doing? Hmm. What was God doing in Genesis chapter 1, verse, verse 1, 26? He says, let us make man. What is God doing? He was creating. 
That's the image in who you were made. It means in Christ, that image gets restored. You can now start to create things just like God has created. What's needed? You need to get your image restored. You need to start to see yourself the way God sees you. Friends, we have to, by faith, say, Jesus, I've lost image. Who am I? The world has told me a lot of stories. Pain has told me a lot of stories. Disappointment has affected me. But who do you say I am? What is my image? And then, when the Holy Spirit shows you the image... What is your response? You have to take that image and you have to create that image by faith. Sin and death has affected the way you see God, you see others, and the way you see yourself. How? By faith. As you're busy reading this, trying to get knowledge of who God is, you're going to discover, oh my goodness, I don't see myself that way. What do you do then? Say, Lord, I repent that I ever held a different view than what you are saying about me. We okay? Okay. People are uncomfortable here because what I'm talking about is your faith and your imagination activated by the Holy Spirit. If you can imagine it because Jesus showed you, you can build it. You can create it. What's it going to cost to build that thing, Yanis? Just faith. Don't worry about the money. The money will flow. Don't worry about the friends. They will show. Why? Because you are learning to align yourself with God, what God said right at the beginning. Oh, wow. Lord, I never saw myself with a six pack. Is it even possible? Lord, you mean there wasn't McDonald's in the garden? Oh, maybe it's a good start. Let's stop the McDonald's. Who's creating it? God or you? You. What's the good news of the resurrection? God has power. (laughs) He's got power. When you believe Jesus was dead, but now he's alive, it shows you God is powerful. That's why we remember his death. That's why we celebrate his resurrection. That's why we have Good Friday and Great Sunday. Why? Because of his power. The word power is the word energy, the workings of God. Hey, can you believe that as God worked in the body of Jesus to raise him to life, that same God will work in your spirit, in your body, to live, to get you to live a resurrection life in Christ? How do you know it's possible? He's done it before. He raised Jesus. Plenty evidence. The issue is not in the evidence. The issue is can you believe it for yourself this morning? Your spirit was dead to God. Fast asleep. I don't want anything to do with God. 
And then God sent the Holy Spirit into your heart saying, hey, there's life. And in one moment, as you hear this message about Christ, your spirit got arrested and you say, I want it. I want this Jesus. I want the sacrifice. I want this resurrection life. In that moment, the power of God started working inside of your spirit to live in the resurrection life of Christ. Your spirit being alive to God. When we celebrate the resurrection, we're celebrating the fact not only that Jesus is alive, but that you're alive to God. Amen. You just need to learn how to, by faith, work with Him. How do you know that Jesus actually did what we said He did this morning? How do you know? How do you know that Jesus was actually raised to life. Thank you. Some of the apostles that walked with him, 500 of them, they saw him, they touched him. It's like, what? So one evidence. One evidence that the people that wrote the New Testament, they saw him. There's the t testimony of others. He was dead. He's very much alive. Second evidence, how do you know? The Scriptures, the Old Testament testifies that God will do something that you will not imagine possible. It says, who will believe this message that God's right hand would come and crush His one and only servant and then raise Him to life? The Old Testament is full of little moments that were saying the same thing. The problem with all of those moments is intellectual. How do you know, there's one th last third one, how do you know that Jesus was raised to life? How? By the Holy Spirit. See, how can you be convinced about the power of God if you've never tasted the power of God yourself? How can you be so convinced? How can you have faith in resurrection power if you've never experienced the reality of the person of the Holy Spirit yourself? How? For 23 years of my life, I heard this truth. I sat over Passion Weekend after Passion Weekend and Pinkster after Pinkster and nothing changed in my life. Till one encounter with the person of the Holy Spirit. He said, listen, you believe every word. He's alive. What happened with Jesus? It says he came, he died, he was crucified on the cross. For three days he was dead. After day three he was rose to life. And for 40 days he spoke to his disciples. And then on day 40, where did he go? <whistles> Superman had nothing on Jesus in that day. What did he receive when he arrived in heaven, according to Acts chapter 2? He received the Holy Spirit. All of the death, all of the suffering, all of the sacrifice, everything done so that Jesus can go to God the Father and says, Father, I've defeated death. Can I now give them the power of the Holy Spirit? What did God the Father say? My son, after what you've done, You read the after effects in Acts 2 of what happened on that day. When people encountered the power of the Holy Spirit. You know what happened? They could not stop talking about Jesus. Nations, tongues. So why is everyone telling me about how good God is? Imagine the West Rand encountering the resurrection power the same way. Imagine what happens to your neighbors. What happens to your boss, to your evil mother-in-law? <laughs> Let's put your evil mother-in-law to death before we trust the Lord to raise her. <laughs> Friends, how can you have power in the faith of God, a faith in the power of God? 
You have to experience the Holy Spirit. I want to ask the band to come and help me. If you're here this morning and you're saying, man, I, I, need, this, I need the Holy Spirit. I need Him. I, I, I need faith in the power. I want to ask you to quickly stand. If you're here this morning and you've never been cut to the heart, but this morning you're saying, my goodness, I, I have to sort my, I have to give my life to Jesus. I have to believe this message. You've never believed it. You heard it. You've never believed it. I want you to quickly raise your hand if that's you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I want to make sure you're being cut in your heart right now. It's like, I need Jesus. I have to make right with him. If that's you, raise your hands. I've seen your hands, sir. Your heart's being cut. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. You can put your hands down, guys. Appreciate it. Just honor your Holy Spirit. We just honor you. Just honor you, Lord. We bless you this morning, Lord. We praise you this morning. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's Him. That's Him. That's Him. Just increase on us, Holy Spirit. Just increase on us, Holy Spirit. Praise you this morning. Jesus, oh, we praise you. You are raised to life. We praise you. Praise you. But there's a moment of agreement that we need to exercise by faith this morning. I want to ask those of us that's standing because you're saying, man, I, I need to encounter the person of the Holy Spirit standing already maybe you're still seated would you come just quickly to my right and your left just to stand in the front just come out of your chairs there's a moment of agreement where we as leaders can come and agree with you for you to receive the person of the Holy Spirit to come in agreement and faith so that the realities that is ours already can become yours I want to ask for those gentlemen that raise their hands to say, man, I, I, need to, I need to accept Jesus this morning. My heart's cut. Would you mind to come and join me on the left of the stage? You're right. Just come quickly out of your chairs. You might feel very uncomfortable right now. But can I tell you how uncomfortable Jesus was while he publicly hung on a cross for you? But you can come this morning and just acknowledge him before others. Just come and bless you. Just come. Just come. Friends, would you mind if we all stood? Let's all stand. We praise you this morning, Lord. We praise you this morning. Some of you, have an opportunity to reset your heart in peace, to reset your heart in gratitude. Let's take the moment to do that. Set your heart in heaven. Some of you have an opportunity to set your mind, to ask for revelation knowledge, to ask for the image of your Creator to to have pictures restored, vision restored, things that you need to see of yourself, of God, of others. Come Holy Spirit. You don't need our permission. You are God. But we want to intentional, intentionally pursue you this morning and allow you a moment to come and bring the resurrection of Christ as a reality into our lives. 
praise you. We praise you. If you still need to respond, because you're saying, I want the person of the Holy Spirit to become my reality this morning, there's an opportunity. Don't miss this opportunity, friends. Don't come after the meeting for it. Just come now. Just come now. Some ladies are saying, oh, Jesus, please let my husband be humble enough to respond now. Guys, you're causing your wife's sweat. She's praying and agonizing and saying, Lord, please, 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 this morning there's an opportunity. And you're like, no, I'm, I'm the rock of Gibraltar. I will not be moved. Just come. There's leaders that's so keen to, to introduce you to the person of the Holy Spirit. Just come.